There's also the idea, speaking of restraining, the restraining and resurgence of witchcraft and, and sorcery. So, so for one small example, it's believed that witchcraft does not work as dramatically today as it did in ancient times because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. In fact, there's actually a documentable trail of witchcraft's loss of efficacy in the first two or three hundred years of Christianity. So we see an example of this in scripture. Quote, now as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit that enabled her to foretell the future by supernatural means. She brought her owners a great prophet by fortune telling. She followed behind Paul and us and kept crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued to do this for many days. I'm going to break in here. Keep in mind, she's telling the truth. Now, this is, this, is going to, this is going to be really important later. Keep in mind, she's not lying. She's telling the truth. And, and you're going to see why that, that's uh, important in just a moment. Continuing on, says, quote, But Paul became greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it came out of her at once. But when her owners saw their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. That is uh, Acts 16, 16 through 19, um, and uh, that, that was from the NET. Now, as it turns out, that kind of activity was actually really common. So from the writings of Eusebius, quote, About that time it is said that Apollo spoke from a deep and gloomy cavern and through the medium of no human voice and declared that the righteous men on earth were a bar to his speaking the truth. He suffered his tresses to droop in token of grief and mourned the evils which the loss of the or oracular spirit would entail on mankind. Now, in this account, the false god Apollo, through an oracle, admitted that the presence of Christians was in inhibiting his ability to speak. Now, you know, he says uh, his, his ability to speak the truth, but we know that anything coming out of the mouth of Apollo is going to be a lie. It, 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 the presence of Christians was inhibiting Apollo's ability to lie, to speak through an oracle, to speak lies. Just like that woman, that, that, that possessed woman. She told the truth. She had a spirit, you know, but she told the truth. She couldn't, she couldn't lie. Because the, the presence of the Holy Spirit within Christians was dampening or restraining the works of oracles and the old gods during this time, Christians themselves actually uh, became more persecuted. So as Lactantius wrote, quote, some, through personal ill will towards the Christians, were of opinion that they ought to be cut off as enemies of the gods and adversaries of the established religious ceremonies. Now, even more interesting, uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit within Christians was causing the false gods to have to be honest about who they were, uh, what they were doing, and who the true God is. We actually see a bit of that in the book of Acts with Paul's run-in with that fortune teller. That fortune teller was telling the truth, right? What, what the evil spirit within this woman was saying was correct about Paul and his companions. They were servants of the Most High, and they were proclaiming the way of salvation. But Paul still cast the evil spirit out of this woman. Now, that's not the only incident like that to be recorded in ancient history. We even have record from Lactantius of one of the final messages of Apollo, who came through an oracle between the 2nd and 3rd centuries. This is what, it, this is what he recorded. Self-produced, untaught, without a mother, unshaken, a name not even to be comprised in word, dwelling in fire. This is God, and we, his messengers, are a slight portion of God. Okay, those are words of Apollo. Now, here, this, this Apollo being makes mention of the true God. Then he, he admits that he's a mere messenger or an angel of his. It's, it's as if Apollo can't help himself. He's trying to lie but he can't help himself but to start letting some of the truth slip out. Now, keep in mind, Apollo right now, because of, of the records here, he, he's in the presence of Christians recording this stuff. Now, even in fact, later, when asked about how he would like to be addressed, Apollo says this. This is what Apollo wants to be called. Quote, 
O all wise, all learned, versed in many pursuits, hear O demon. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's funny, it's kind of funny to think about this. You know, so they're asking Apollo, you know, how do you want to be addressed? What do you want to be called? And he starts off kind of prideful, you know, he's, oh, call me all wise, call me all learned, call me O demon. Yep, whoops. <laughs> it's it's funny because it's in the presence of, of Christians, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and especially by this time because uh, Christianity had had a couple hundred years to, to spread, the more that the, the, the Spirit is spreading over the earth in Christians, uh, the more dampened, the more restrained these spirits get. Uh, and and it, it really seems like these spirits, they have to tell the truth in the presence of the Holy Spirit. They have to tell the truth. So Apollo says that he's a demon. So again, it's, it's almost humorous to think about that. For generations, Apollo masqueraded as a god. Then the Holy Spirit inhabits Christians, and suddenly Apollo is unable to keep up the disguise. He can no longer call himself God. He has to admit who God is. Then he tries saying that he's one of God's angels, but even that is too deceptive to keep up anymore. So he eventually slips up, and again, when asked how he wants to be addressed, um, or, or supplicated in the words of Lactantius, Apollo requests to be called a demon, because that's what he is. Even more, Apollo apparently did, uh, didn't just slip up once, but he kept doing it over and over. Apparently this was an ongoing thing, like Apollo just could not keep up the lies. He, he couldn't help himself, he was compelled to tell the truth. Uh, here's what Lactantius uh, uh, says, quote, and so again, when at the entreaty of someone, he uttered an imprecation against the Smithian Apollo, he began with this verse, O harmony of the world, bearing light, all wise demon. What therefore remains, except that by his own confession, he is subject to the scourge of the true God and to everlasting punishment. For in another response, he also said, the demons who go about the earth and about the sea without weariness are subdued beneath the scourge of God. So the presence and power of the Holy Spirit did more to damage the kingdom of darkness than we typically realize. That's why we live in the type of world that we live in. Um, we don't see witchcraft all over the place anymore the way that it was in the Old Testament because it's been dampened, it's been restrained. Uh, the Holy Spirit, the, the, the spread of the Holy Spirit through Christians, through the spread of the gospel, did a lot more damage to the kingdom of darkness and, and drove it underground a lot more than we realize. So if their power, uh, these agent, agents of darkness, if their power is restrained and it is difficult for them to maintain lies to humanity anymore, it would explain a lot about what's going on in our world. If the presence of the Holy Spirit dampens the kingdom of darkness, then of course they would try to degrade society as much as possible. They would, they would try to, to, to get the Holy Spirit you know, away as much as possible. They would try to dampen the Holy Spirit by deceiving people into rejecting Jesus uh, so that they have room to be able to operate. This could explain the fascination in our society with things like witchcraft. Uh, severe moral decay, uh, and a denial of the Holy Spirit as, co as a co-equal member of the Trinity. I mean, that, that has exploded in popularity, uh, uh, and it's not, it's not even, I mean, by definition, if you deny the Trinity, then you're part of a cult, but it's not even, uh, it's, it's not even confined to just the cults anymore. But in, in every single cult who calls themselves Christian, they always deny the Trinity, they, and, and they attack the Holy Spirit. It, it, this is simply the kingdom of darkness trying to get their power back, trying to get a foothold. The less presence and influence the Holy Spirit has in a location, meaning the fewer number of um, the fewer the number of Christians, the more the more powerful the kingdom of darkness becomes. So this is why they had such a difficult time when Christianity was exploding throughout the world in the first few centuries, and the the enemy just resorted to just killing them all or trying to anyway, but that didn't work. And Christianity was strong in the world for a long time. But today, those evil entities are making a bit more of a restrained comeback. Now, if all of this is true, when the Holy Spirit is removed, there should be a resurgence of all manners of sorcery and witchcraft that will suddenly begin operating in dramatic ways. Now, I think that this is likely the explanation behind the lying signs and wonders of the Antichrist and the false prophet and other individuals during that time that we read about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. 
now. Imagine decades of that. Imagine being born into that kind of world. You didn't know the, the materialistic world where witchcraft didn't really work all that well and you didn't see it in day-to-day -day life. But imagine being born in a world where that's like, it's pretty common. You know, it would become the new normal. So not only does this explain all the magic and sorcery and witchcraft in the Old Testament, but having this understanding can help bring certain Bible passages about the future into clearer focus. So like this, for example, quote, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12. Here's another one. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. That's Revelation 16, 13 through 14. Or how about this one? Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall rise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. It's Matthew 24, 23 through 24. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their witchcraft, nor of their sexual immorality, nor of their thefts. That's Revelation 9, 20 through 21. Here's another one. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Revelation 13, 11 through 15. The sorcery and witchcraft become so unrestrained that they can even give life to an inanimate object. It, it now becomes a lot easier, a lot clearer, to imagine why the generation of the tribulation is so reluctant to repent. The restraining power of sorcery and witchcraft has been released, and all manner of previously impossible things suddenly become possible. You have a transition age. You have a transition generation, you know, where the rapture happens. Some people are left behind. Um, many, but, but many of them are adults. So they, they grew up in a pre-rapture world. Rapture happens. They're left behind. Many of them probably will think that it's the rapture. Some may not, but some get saved. But then a decade or two go by. That generation starts to pass away, and a new generation starts to uh, be born and rise up. They are now living in a post-rapture, post-great disappearance world where all things are possible. Witchcraft is possible. Sorcery. It probably won't be called that. It'll probably be called something, something more wonderful. But all of these things become possible. And because of that, you know, they, they, learn about, they learn about those silly people who thought it was the rapture, but then more than seven years passed with no Antichrist and no return of Jesus. So they breathe a sigh of relief. They, they believe they have, they, they have safety. They believe they have peace. Then the events of the tribulation start to unfold. Now, it's funny because at, I believe the sixth seal... Um, it's funny because at that point, you see people say, um, and I believe this is somewhere around halfway into the tribulation, they say, oh, the, 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 the wrath of God and the Lamb 
ha has come. You know, the the, ra the wrath has come. And actually, when you look at the Greek, it's it's like saying the the wrath has already come. The, the wrath has been here for a while. You know, the the wrath has been here for three and a half years or so. But what's funny is right after that, we read that they're back to being unrepentant. Well, what happened? When when you actually time this out, and again, I talk about all this in um, Lost uh, Prophecies of Qumran, so get my book, but when you time all this out, the event that happens is the killing of the two witnesses. You have the two witnesses in the first half of the tribulation, and, and for many reasons that probably don't have time to get into today, but for many reasons, I believe that the, the, the uh, two witnesses come in the first half of the tribulation. Well, for all this time, you have them preaching that it's the tribulation. Some people accept it, some people don't. Um, but the two witnesses are able to destroy their enemies. So when the cosmic signs start happening, these people are freaking out and, and saying, oh, this is the wrath of God. The two witnesses are right. This is the wrath of God and the Lamb. But then what happens? The Antichrist comes and kills the two witnesses. He destroys them. All of a sudden, they are right back, and they, they don't believe that this is God. Or if they, if they do believe it's God, they believe the Antichrist is more powerful somehow. And they start believing the Antichrist lies. They, they, they go back into witchcraft and uh, sorcery, and they're right back to unrepentance, and they believe that this is their guy. This is the guy that can beat God, because he killed the two witnesses. When you time it all out, that's what happens. That's why there's that switch. That's why you have... Um, uh, near the, the, the because I, I, I believe that the way that Revelation is structured, I believe you get the seals first, then the trumpets, then the vials. Some people believe these all happen at the same time. Uh, and I used to believe that, but um, not, not anymore. The, the timeline actually works out really well when you view it kind of like that. The, the seventh seal introduces the trumpets, the seventh trumpet introduces uh, the vials or the bulls. But that's what happens. So, Again, that restraining power of sorcery and witchcraft has been released after the rapture. And if there's a long period of time between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation, let's say 40 or 50 years, uh, if you got a long period of time there, you have time for a new generation to be brought up in this world of witchcraft and sorcery, where people who believed in the rapture would seem silly. Clearly, that wasn't the rapture because we're 30 years away from it and there's still no Jesus. Um, and they live in a world where all things are possible. They, they, they have power that they didn't have before. This, this will, I, I believe that this will become such an ingrained part of society and life in general that it'll become nearly impossible for people to refuse this. It, it'll be too tempting. I mean, this might actually have something to do with the strong delusion that's mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 through 12. Now, what we've talked about before is ages. And the ancient Essenes had an understanding of 2,000-year ages. There's three of those, and then there's a Sabbath, a half age, like a 1,000-year Sabbath at the end. 1,000 years is the uh, millennial reign. So according to the Essene calendar, according, according to that, um, we should expect the end of our age of grace to occur in 2075. Now, again, and I've talked about this before, while the calendar has a specific date, events don't always uh, correlate to an exact date. A lot of times you have the beginning of one end, uh, age kind of bleeds back into the end of the, the previous age. So you, you see that, for example, at the end of the age of Torah, in the beginning of the uh, Age of Grace. Technically, the Age of Grace began, technically, according to the Essene calendar, in 75 AD. But we would say the Age of Grace, or the Church Age, started with Jesus, maybe during his ministry, maybe at the cross. I would say at Pentecost. I think that that's the true starting date um, of, of, of the Church. But technically, according to the calendar, uh, it doesn't really start until 75 AD, and it's because there's this bleeding through effect of these ages. So you might expect the same thing to, to happen again with a, a type of bleeding through. So if the end of this age is truly 2075, and if that is the year that Jesus will return, and I don't know that for sure, <laughs> okay, nobody does, this is a guess, but we would expect the tribulation to begin in 2068. 
But if the rapture were, were to occur much earlier, let's say at the beginning of the final jubilee of our age in 2025, and again, this is just a guess, but let's say if it did occur in 2025, then the world would have 43 years to forget and to move on from the great disappearance. Now, amazingly, that is the exact number of years between the death of Jesus in 32 AD and the end of the age of Torah in AD 75. Um, 43 years. So you would have 43 years, if, and this is just a guess, again, if the rapture happened in 2025, you would have 43 years before the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. And that's enough time for a whole new generation of people to be brought up and for people to breathe a sigh of relief, thinking that Jesus isn't coming back, this wasn't the rapture, this was some natural occurrence, um, and, you know, who, who knows? Uh, but but that, that's how that could work. The rapture could, and I say could, I'm not saying it will, could occur in 2025, leaving 43 years until the beginning of the tribulation in 2068, or the rapture could happen in thir uh, 2032 A.D., um, to exactly 2,000 years uh, after the, the, the after Pentecost, the, the giving of the Holy Spirit to the church, uh, leaving 43 years until the return of Jesus. Um, maybe it doesn't count to, to the beginning of the tribulation. Maybe it counts till the return of Jesus, but that would still be a 43-year period. But either way, this would also mean that we would have had 40, the, the world would have had 43 years uh, to, 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 experience this new way of life, but it would mean that we, as Christians, would have had 43 years with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ if the rapture came in 2025 instead of a few years or decades later. Now, in fact, if the rapture came a bit later, in 2038 rather than 2025, we could consider the principle of jubilees as a period of rest. So every 50th year is a jubilee. There are 40 jubilee cycles in a span of 2,000 years. Um, so let me say that again. Every 50th year is a jubilee. So you got 49 years. That 50th year is a jubilee. That's what, that's what they called it. it. It's like a time of a reset. It's like a rest. And there are 40 jubilee cycles in a span of 2,000 years, meaning there are 40 jubilees in there. Could it be possible that these Jubilee years are being saved up for us and that we will get to experience 40 years with our Lord after the rapture but before the tribulation, uh, after 2,000 years of the church being on the earth? Or possibly God will give us a full Jubilee cycle with him in heaven, a full 50 years. The rapture could happen in 2025, giving us 50 years, a full Jubilee to reside in heaven with Jesus until we return with him in 2075. Now, of course, this is all speculation, all right? Um, this is all speculation. Uh, but it's interesting to think about. Now, there's other areas that I want to talk about that might add some more legitimacy to this. And I want to, I just really want to make sure that I'm emphasizing, we're speculating here about these dates. You know, we can't set a date on the rapture. You can't really set a date on the return of Jesus until the tribulation starts. Once the tribulation starts, then those who are on the earth and remain, uh, and those who know the prophecies, then they'll know. Um, but we can't set a date on the rapture. It could happen at any time. Uh, but I believe that it'll be sometime before the beginning of the tribulation, uh, before the beginning of the tribulation. So we have to keep that in mind. We cannot be banking on the fact like, oh, 2025, the rapture is going to happen. Don't plan your life around that, all right? Uh, live in constant expectation. We should be doing that for sure. Um, but don't point to a date and say that that's the date and I'm going to plan everything around that. Uh, I'm just using these as, as examples.